Okay, start again. <laughs> Mark chapter 5, begin at about verse 34. We'll kind of review a few things we talked about last time, but uh, try to, to move ahead as quick as we can. Uh, we talked about last time, we begun with the uh, lesson about the healing uh, of uh, Jairus' daughter. Uh, that particular miracle is interrupted, the uh, events of that, rather interrupted by a woman who's had an issue of blood for 12 years that comes up behind Jesus, touches his garment, and immediately she's healed. And Jesus wanted to know who touched her. He realizes who it is, and he turned to look at her. And when she realized she couldn't be hid, she came forward and told the whole truth of what had happened. And, and that's where we're at. And, and we, we talked about the woman. Uh, the Bible mentions the fact that she was afraid, uh, even to the extent that she was trembling when Jesus had called her out. And, uh, but then when you look at the reply that Jesus made to her, and that's really where we want to begin looking at this morning, uh, his, his reply to her, uh, to this woman, and that's found here then in verse uh, 34. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now, a few things about that to me that are, that are interesting. We need to just mention, if we can here, about this. Uh, number one, the words that he uses. He says, Daughter. Uh, she is a, a daughter. She is a fellow Jew. Uh, and so he speaks to her with kindness here. It shows he's not angry at this woman. She's fearful that he might have been angry because of the fact that that's been expressed with her fear and her trembling. But he says to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So she doesn't have to worry about anything that, that Christ is angry at her for any reason, but she can go in peace. He, he mentions that to her and then adds to that the statement, and be healed of your affliction. But I thought she was healed. I thought she was healed as soon as she touched His clothes. So what does Jesus mean when He says, and be healed of your affliction? Yeah, it's already been done, so why would He say be healed? What's that? Yeah, well, she's already convinced of it because she felt it. She knew immediately. Yeah. I think maybe, uh, this is maybe speculation on my part, but I think that what Jesus is saying with it was to let this woman, you don't have to fear that this is going to come back upon you. Now, we initially, we talked about last week, we mentioned that someone in the class mentioned maybe she was afraid that Jesus would take that healing back away from her and she would be afflicted with that problem again. And maybe that's the reason why she was fearful when he called her out. But he wants her to know, no, you know, be healed of your affliction. That let her know this this is a permanent thing. You don't have to worry about that. I'm not taking it back. You will be healed of it. Uh, and, and you'll be able to continue on in good health and not have to worry about that in your life again. You'll be healed of that. And so through it all, he's showing his kindness toward this woman and his love for her so that she doesn't fear and tremble anymore. She doesn't have to be fearful of that. And so, he's talking to her about that. Now, the interesting thing is, the next thing we get to, and it's going to tie in with this, uh, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. Now, it's interesting, when, when we look through this, initially I had titled this, The Healing of Jairus' Daughter. But now, it's too late to heal her of the affliction she had because now she's dead. And so what we're going to be dealing with is the resurrection of Jairus' daughter here. So let's look at these few verses here, beginning at verse uh, 35 here. And again, this is from the uh, New King James Version. It says, While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, He said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And He permitted no one to follow Him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So, while Jesus is still engaged in, in talking with this woman with the issue of blood that's been healed, it's while He's still talking to her that word comes to Jairus that his daughter is dead. And 
couple of things about that. If you've ever had to, to deliver a message like that to someone, to let them know that, you know, that some loved one has died, I, I wonder how hard that must be sometimes for doctors when they have to come in and, and tell a family that. But usually when they do, most of the time the doctors are, are trying to look for the right words to say and to deliver a message of that, you know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry um, for this bad news I have, you know, but your loved one has passed on. But just to come out with a statement, your daughter's dead. It almost seems kind of harsh uh, to it. I, I don't think the person would have meant that, but it seems kind of strange. But then he follows that up with a question. And the question is, why trouble you the teacher anymore? Now, the answer, the news that this man gives and the statement and the question kind of presents the case to Jairus is, is your case is now hopeless. And why, why are you troubling the teacher anymore? In fact, one of the translations, the Bible in basic English, uh, renders it that way. I think it's given, why are you still troubling the Master? Why, why are you continuing to wait for this man to come with you back to your house because it's too late. Your daughter's dead. And you need to understand that. So don't trouble him anymore. Uh, and that seems rather harsh because that, that just takes away all hope that Jairus might have. Uh, and that, you know, I think for the most part that, that could be understood. Uh, you know, today in our world, uh, even here in our city where we've got some fantastic medical facilities and, and so much good is able to be done in these hospitals. Uh, and, and so many times people that have serious illnesses or injuries that they receive, and I don't know how many times uh, I have known of individuals, not just here but in other places, who've had serious accidents and maybe they've suffered uh, head trauma. And, and the doctors, you know, initially tell them, you know, He's got maybe a 10% chance of pulling through. You know? And, and then, and later though, they do. They get better. Uh, and they've no, suffered no permanent damage from that. You know, it hasn't affected their, their ability to think, or to reason, to understand, to remember. Uh, and, and you think, man, that's fantastic. 10% chance. And yet, they come through it remarkably well. And praise God for that. Uh, give God the glory for that. But I mean, things like that happen. But when the case comes and the doctor calls it, and he calls the time of death, that the individual is now dead, they stop working on the body. They stop trying to, because they know there, there's nothing we can do. As long as that person's alive, there's hope, and there, there's some things we might do that might really bring them around, might help them out. But once they're dead, the doctors realize, you know, that's it. There's nothing more we can do. There's no hope we have. And so, that's probably the idea that this messenger has. But people back then understand death. Once that occurs, there's nothing that can be done. And so that's the message they bring. And like I said, it, it's, it's got to be the type of thing that would destroy the hope that a person has. Uh, and that's what happens. They tell them, why trouble you the teacher any longer? In other words, it's hopeless. Let him go. There are other people maybe that he can help. And, and you need to let him go and let him do that. Now, we talked a little bit about this last week as you look at it. Uh, the reaction that Jairus may have had to this news. Uh, let's see. If it, how he may have felt, what he may have thought at this time when he's told his daughter is dead. You know, we, we, we kind of speculate, you know, what his feelings might have been toward Jesus. You know, maybe he's thinking, you know, if you hadn't spent so much time with this woman after she's been healed and you sit there talking with her and listening to her as she explains all that she's been through, you know, if you'd have left immediately after she was healed, maybe we would have gotten back to my house in time and you could have healed my daughter. But that didn't happen. So I can understand how he may have felt like that. He may have been thinking, you know, you, you should have acted more quickly uh, than everything would not be in this hopeless situation that I'm in right now that my daughter's dead. And now there, there's no hope for what I can do. 
And, and when you look at it, and I think this is important, uh, is to notice the reaction again of Jesus in regard to this. Uh, we can speculate, speculate about how these others may have felt about it, but we know exactly uh, Jesus' attitude toward this and the words that He spoke to them. Uh, so His reaction to this news, that he immediately He turns to Jairus, and what does He tell him? Do not... Yeah. Do not be afraid. Only believe. Yes, sir? Okay, I, and I thought about. It. I thought you know, to me, I could understood. I could have understood if Jesus had said to him, uh, "Don't be angry." Okay, don't be discouraged. But instead, he says, "Don't be afraid." Afraid of what? Do what? The death of his daughter. Well, why be afraid? I mean, she's already dead. You, you, you gonna, are you going to be afraid that she might die again? Yeah, I, I think that's it. You know, the news that he's been given, don't bother the teacher anymore because your daughter's dead. So, you know, it's totally hopeless. Don't do that. And, and that would be it. So Jesus, I think Jesus told him, don't be afraid that there's no hope. Don't be afraid that's the end of it. Because with Christ, there's always hope. But then he answered that, not only don't be afraid, but he says, only believe. Now, one of the interesting things to me about that, now I don't, like I said, I don't normally do this, but I just got to looking up the, the word believe there as it is in the Greek. And, and the particular word that he uses there, of course, it's from pistuo, but it's it's not present active indicative. It is a second person singular. So Jesus is talking you singular. He's talking to Jairus, nobody else, and he's speaking to Jairus and telling him to believe. But it's imperative, so that means this is a command he's giving him. But more important to me than that is it's present tense. Now what does present tense always suggest in, in a verb? Continual action. Keep on believing. Now, if Jesus is saying to him, don't be afraid, just keep on believing, what does that imply about Jairus? He had believed. He had, he had faith in Christ. And the faith that he had in Jesus was an active faith. Uh, if you stop about his daughter is sick, the Bible says she was near to death, and yet because of the faith that this man has in Jesus, he leaves his daughter and goes in search of Jesus. Why does he do that? Faith that this man can help. And, and when he gets to Jesus, what does he do? He shows reverence to him, he falls down at Jesus' feet and beseeches him that he might come to heal his daughter. And, and Jesus agrees and, and they've started on the way back to Jairus' house when it's interrupted. So Jairus has shown his faith in Jesus and he's shown it by his actions. It's not just something he said, but it's how he's acted that shows his faith in Jesus. And now Jesus is telling him, don't be afraid. I know it sounds hopeless, don't be afraid and think there's no hope now for your daughter, but continue believing. Continue to have that confidence in Jesus. And that's the great thing about it. Uh, because with Christ, there's always hope. Yes, sir? I want to ask, uh, a synagogue official, what type of position was that going to be? Part of the, the leaders over there? Or somebody that's like uh, escorting people in? or No. That we, we talked about that initially, about what all involved in that. Uh, and he was just one, one of the rulers. And so evidently there was a group of them uh, that kind of you know, led the congregation there, the synagogue. They would be the ones sometimes who would determine who's going to speak. If you'll notice later on in, in the book of Acts when Paul is doing his traveling and he goes into synagogues, 
And sometimes it'll be the ruler may ask him, brother, if you have something to say, say on. You know, they, they're responsible for that. They're also responsible for uh, the orthodoxy to make sure that everybody is remaining within the law of God. They're not bringing in something false from that. And so he's one of those men that has that, that authority, that responsibility. And so he's the one that's concerned about it. Jesus wants him to know, don't be afraid. Don't give up hope. Keep on believing. And so then when you look at Luke's account of it, uh, Luke gives a reason, or at least Jesus in that account, gives to uh, Jairus a reason to keep on believing. Uh, because in Luke's account of it, it says, do not be afraid, only believe, and she shall be made well. That's a promise that Jesus is making. Here's why you need to keep on believing. Because Christ, even though she's dead, Christ has the, the power to make things right again, to make her well, to bring her back to life and in good health. And so, you know, just keep on believing. So He gives them a reason to keep on believing. Uh, he's had that confidence that Christ can heal, but so far He hasn't raised anybody from the dead, and you need to have that confidence that He can do that. That even in the event of death, Jesus still has the ability to help. And so they're going to go on, but as they go on on the journey, uh, Jesus only allows three people to go with Him. Peter, James, and John. Uh, these are kind of the, the inner circle of Jesus' friends. And it's something that's, that's developing here. Uh, that, that, that closeness that they have to Jesus. But it's primarily because uh, of, of their abilities and because of their uh, their actions and what they're doing, uh, their, their confidence and faith in Jesus and serving Him. And, and you'll find that again and again uh, through the Bible. Uh, what are some other occasions when these three men are the only ones uh, allowed to be with Jesus? Transfiguration. Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17. Those three men were there to see Jesus being transfigured. And on that occasion, they also they were the three that were there to hear God speak and say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. You're not listening to Moses. You're not listening to Elijah any longer. You listen to Christ. He's God's Son. Uh, what about another occasion? The garden. Uh, the night of His betrayal that Jesus is going to be arrested. And He and His disciples have gone there to that garden. But when they get there, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and they go a little further into the garden. And He tells those three men, watch and pray for Me. And then He goes a little further in to pray to His Father. So they, they have that blessing from God, uh, from Christ, that they have that closeness to Him. And, and I think that one of the reasons why they have it is because these men have shown themselves uh, to be faithful servants to Him in, in a special way. Uh, Later, Jesus is going to teach a parable of the talents. Uh, five talents, two talents, and one talent. The man that had five gained five more. The man that had two gained two more. The man that had one talent did what with his? He buried it. He was afraid. Well, if, if I try to use it, I might lose it all. So he buried it. And, and when the master comes back, uh, he commands the five talent man and the two talent man because they've doubled what they had. But to the one talent man, he condemns him and he says, take his talent and do what with it? Give it to the man that has ten talents. It, Jesus said, to him that has shall more be given. These men, Peter, James, and John, I believe have shown themselves effective in their service to God and using their abilities, their talents, in serving God. And so they're blessed in a special way. And Brother Kaufman points out uh, that, that, that not only that, but he says this marked a new milestone in Jesus' ministry. Already the ability of these three has earned for them a closer relationship with the Lord. But that relationship was not predicated merely upon ability, but upon the role each of these would have in the future spread of Christianity. Uh, what about James? What's going to happen to him in the future? Death. He's the first one to be killed. He, he dies a faithful martyr of Christ. 
And so, you know, uh, that's an example for everyone else uh, who wants to be a part of the kingdom. That's the way we need to live. We need to live, be faithful to Christ even unto death. That's what Jesus taught in Revelation 2.10. We need to have it. But what about Peter? Yeah, but something else. I'm talking about the first. James was the first to die. And I guess there, I guess there are other things in the Bible you can say about Peter the first, but this is one of the. He did what now? Oh well, yeah, he was crucified upside down according to tradition. Uh, but the thing about Peter, the first thing that I thought about was he's the first one to use the keys to open up the kingdom. He preached the first gospel sermon that we have recorded for us there in Acts chapter 2. But there, there's another first though with Peter too in that regard. He was the first one to confess publicly that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God of Matthew chapter 16. So, you know, he, he has a, a big part to play also in the spread of Christianity uh, because he's the first one to preach the gospel sermon to open up the kingdom to people. Well, what about John? Something special about John, he is the last witness to die for Christ among the apostles. Uh, he gets to live longer, you know. Uh, there, there were some that began believing that that, that uh, John was going to live till Jesus came back again. Uh, because Jesus had said, what is that to thee? You know, if, if I want to, if this man lives. He didn't say he was going to, but what if I do that? He tells, you follow me. Uh, but John does live. Uh, died there, evidently on the Isle of Patmos, where he had been uh, uh, sent either forcibly or maybe he went in order to preach the gospel there. I think either one could be true, but that's his first. He, he's the one, the last of the apostles to die. Uh, and he is the one who preached, has a written the gospel account, but also the book of Revelation uh, to give the assurance to people of the victory that all Christians will have in Christ. So these men ha have, have special relationships to Christ, but it's because they're willing to use the talents that they had and Christ is blessing them with more, more opportunities, opportunities to see things and to hear things that others won't see and hear, and that certainly is going to be the case here. Because these are the only ones that are allowed to go with Jesus. Well, what about the rest of the apostles that were there? We don't know. Uh, some have speculated maybe those other apostles were left there to, to uh, maybe dismiss the multitude that's been following Jesus uh, and uh, you know encourage them to go back to their homes and not to continue following. And so it's just Jesus, Jairus, maybe the messenger that's come to Jairus, and these three apostles, they continue on, uh, on their way to the home of Jairus. Now, when, when you get there, uh, let's see, uh, beginning at verse 38 and going through verse 13, it says, Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he put them out, all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kuma, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. So, they continue on. They get to the house, and, and, and as they draw near even, they can hear the uproar that's going on. And, and what is this uproar? What is this tumult that he hears? <coughs> Yet the mourning of the people. Uh, 
They're, they're weeping and wailing that's going on. Now, just curious because I know my first thought. When, when I saw the word weeping, what, what, what do you imagine in your mind when someone is weeping? What is, what is that? What is weeping? Crying. Uh, you know, I see these people sitting there in tears, flowing down their eyes. But that's not at all what the Greek word means. And again, you know, this just amazes me. Uh, the Greek word there is the word klio. Uh, and according to Vines, uh, he says, it is used of any loud expression of grief, especially in mourning the dead. Any loud expression. Well, it may be crying in the sense of crying out. Uh, their, their expression of their sorrow at the situation. This young girl is dead. And so, that's one of the things. But then in addition to that, uh, there's another word. The only other word that's used in the New Testament that's translated weeping is the Greek word dikruo. Uh, and interestingly enough, I, I never knew anything about this, that word is only used of Jesus. Now, John chapter 11, verse 35, at the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus wept. He was shedding tears. That's what that word means, to shed tears. But on this occasion, the people are just crying out, screaming out uh, of the sorrow at the death of this young lady. But then in addition to that, it says they were wailing. Uh, and, and the word wail there in the Greek is the word alalaso. Now, it's hard for, for us to understand it, but it, it's a word that's known as the onomatopoeic word. You know, we've talked about that before. I don't know if you remember it or not. That's just a word that the very sounding of the word expresses it. Like uh, if you talk about a, a bee buzzing, bzzz, well, that's onomatopoeic. The word itself is making the sound that the bee is making. And so the word here, is making the sound, and you see it in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation of it, battle cries, when people are going into battle, the things that they would cry out and scream out. Uh, <coughs> just the word itself uh, kind of explains the sound that they're making uh, as they're crying out. But interestingly enough, that same word is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When Paul talks about have the faith to be like a clanging symbol. That word clanging, it's the same word in the Greek. And so, again, it's just, it's just a loud noise that they're making. So, the whole thing that's going on there, no wonder, you know, when Jesus is approaching, He can hear this tumult going on. This uproar. Uh, it's because the people that are gathered there are just screaming out and they're sorrow. Now, that's pretty much basic in, in those Near Eastern countries. And even today, if you, if you ever watch on the news sometime when there's been a bombing or something uh, there, you know, in Israel or, or in Syria, uh, and those places where those people, you know, a loved one has been killed. And, and sometimes you see them when they're burying a coffin, they go to the burial, and, and they're just screaming out in their, their sorrow at what's happened. Uh, and that's pretty much what's happened here on this occasion. Now, Sometimes you might even have hired mourners, pe people that are paid to do that. Uh, and I think here in this occasion, that, that may have been some, but I'm, I'm sure this man being a ruler of the synagogue, there were a lot of people who would have known him and who would have known his daughter who are there and they are crying out in genuine sorrow at what's happened here for them. And so... Uh, that, that's what's going on. And when Jesus gets there to the people, he, he kind of rebukes them. He says, why all this commotion? Why this uproar? Well, Jesus understands why there would be an uproar at death, especially the death of a child. But Jesus doesn't understand why there's this commotion when He says the child's not dead, but she's sleeping. And when he said that, the people responded to him uh, with ridicule. They ridiculed him for saying she's not dead, she's asleep. 
because in their mind they knew this little girl was dead. In fact, again, if you look in Luke's account of it, Luke makes that statement uh, that, that, that they ridiculed him knowing that she was dead. Uh, and Jesus was, was not mistaken. He wasn't ignorant. He understood physical death. And he understood this little girl was dead physically. So why refer to it as a sleep? Hmm, sir? Yeah, he knows. And he knows he's going to be able to do that. Uh, you look in, in back in John chapter 11, talk again about Lazarus. Uh, when news comes that Lazarus is sick, he waits two days before leaving. And when he gets ready to leave, he tells his disciples, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I go to awake him out of sleep. And their response, the disciples' response to him is, Lord, if he's sleeping, he's doing good. That means he's on the mend, so leave him alone. And so then Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So he knows, but he still refers to it as asleep because if somebody's asleep, for the most part, I know there's some sound sleepers, but for the most part, it doesn't take much. You can just reach over and tap them and, you know, to wake them up. Uh, you can't do that with somebody that's dead. Well, you can if you're Jesus. You've got that power that He can take a dead person and He can call their name and they'll awake. And it's just as easy for Him to do that to a dead person as it is if you and I to do that for a person who's sleeping. And so that's why he refers to it as a sleep. And, and, and again and again, you'll see that over and over in the Bible. Uh, uh, the Bible will talk about that. It, it'll talk about death in terms of being a sleep that the people uh, are there. And it's because Christ sees it that way. That's the way it is for Him. They're, they're sleeping. So then, with that in mind, uh-oh, uh there we go, uh, the text says, get it, chapter 5, verse 38, says, Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were, over, oh, I can't hardly read that myself from here, overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. Uh, now, I like this about Mark. We talked about it in, in the very beginning of the book. One of the things that distinguishes Mark's writing is he uses this word youthus, Greek word, over and over, which means immediately. And we've seen it several times already. And so here it is. Here's the ease with which Jesus can raise somebody from the dead. That he says, little girl, arise, and immediately, Mark says she arose. And so, just as easy as waking up somebody who's asleep. That's the power of Christ that He has here. Now, the Bible, when it talks about it, says that He, he had put outside all of those who mourned. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm getting behind on this. For some reason, it's not wanting to advance. All right. He put out all those who mourned. He put them out because they denied what Jesus had said. Uh, Jesus said, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they laughed at Him, ridiculed Him, laughed Him to scorn because of that. And so, hey, you don't have faith in Christ? Then you're not going to be blessed to see this miracle. So all of them are put outside. And then, Jesus and the three apostles with Him and the parents go in to where the little girl is lying. So they've all been in the house, but they've been in a different room from where the child is at. And because these multitude of people there uh, show their doubt in Christ, they're put outside. I wonder sometimes how many times we, we miss blessings because of a lack of faith uh, that these people have. That's why it's so important we continue to believe uh, in every instance of life, whatever. And don't allow anything to destroy your faith that you have in Christ. You do so, and you may miss the greatest blessings of all. Uh, we, we may miss being blessed with Him eternally. So anyhow, they're put outside. And then Jesus, the three apostles with Him, and the parents of this child go into the room, and that's when Jesus speaks this word to her. Uh, 
and says, little girl, I say to you, arise. Uh, now, literally, in the Greek, it's, it's much shorter than that. Uh, literally, the Greek would simply say, damsel, arise. Uh, but this is going to let us know Jesus is the one speaking. He's the one that's saying that. So He's the one that has the power uh, to command this child to arise, and she does. So that's brought out to her. Now, He, he, he takes her by the hand and speaks that, and, and she gets up. Now, here's the thing that's really, I think, important about this. And this came from uh, Brother Doris and his uh, commentary about this. He says, The maiden of whom we here read arose only to a dying life, a life which needed the support of food and was in no respect more noble or more secure than that of other mortals. Jesus raises her up, but when He raises her up, she's still in that situation. She is a mortal person, and she's going to die again. Just like Lazarus, he was raised from the dead, but he died again. And that's going to happen to her. Uh, and, and, and her life that she has is not going to be blessed in, in a way that, that she's going to have better health than anybody else, or that she's not ever going to die again. That, that's not it. She's going to have problems physically, just like everybody else will have, and eventually she will die again. But, as Brother Doris continues on, he says, uh, in, in regard to us, he said, but we look for a better resurrection in which all the infirmities of the body shall be left behind in the grave, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. This young lady is raised up only to live a life that will have sorrow, that will have crying, and eventually will have death again. But when the great day of resurrection comes and all that are in the grave hear His voice and come forth, we're going to come forth to an entirely different resurrection. We're going to come forth with a spiritual body. Uh, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. Uh, we're coming forth to eternal life, never to die again, but to live with God eternally in heaven. So, you know, again, a great thing for us to remember as children of God. Uh, we, we look at things like this in the Bible and say, man, what a great miracle. I, I wish we had something like that today. I wish you when somebody that we love so much passes away that, that we could raise them up again. Why? You just raise them up to a dying life. They're going to die again. Okay. That's right. You know, she... That's right. And this young girl, she comes to us, when she's resurrected, she's still in that same physical body. And it's going to have the same infirmities that we all have. But when we are resurrected in the last day, we're going to come forth with a spiritual body. Yes, sir, Jerry? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going deaf too. That she was 12 years old? Well, I don't know, just when it says when she walked, I mean, everything that she used before, I think one time the used word uh, in Luke, uh, it's a uh, pious little girl. And I believe that's a diminutive for a child. So that can refer even to a baby. So maybe just to make it clear, we're not talking about a little baby. Uh, this, this baby is resurrected and gets up and walks. No, th this is a 12-year-old girl. And so it lets us know that, that she's the one that got up and walked. So it's a great miracle that Jesus has done, but it gives to us a great hope for that resurrection when we'll all be brought forth to a new life uh, better than her. But then, the last thing we'll mention here, because our time is really just about gone. Uh, well, I thought I'd put that up there. I hadn't. All right, let me get just a bit. Jesus gives a strict command to them. Not just a command, but a strict command not to make this known. Now, it would be impossible for this not to be made known. And, and the reason why is because there's been a multitude of people there. Uh, and, and they're convinced this little girl's dead and Jesus said, no, she's just asleep. 
and they're put outside the house. Now, when Jesus raises that child up and they're told to give her something to eat, you know, you know, you can't keep that a secret. Where you're going to go hide that little girl the rest of her life? No, it's going to be known, and, and these people are going to know it. And, and in their minds, they were convinced she was dead, and yet she's raised. So it's going to be known. But I think maybe what Jesus is saying: Don't go out and start spreading this, telling everybody about it. Why? I mean, it, it's made known today. We all know it. Why not make it known then? Right. You know, you, you think what if, when people have learned that He's in a place and He's healing people that are sick and the multitudes come in and swarm, now what are they going to do when they learn, hey, He raises people from the dead? You know, then like Mona said, then maybe everybody's going to want their beloved one to be raised up from the dead. Uh, and, and He would be you know, really have multitudes surrounding him. And he'd never be able to get anything done that needs to be done. So I think they did a, a good job of it too. I, I think they kept quiet. I don't think they went out spreading that, telling people about this. Uh, and those that see that little girl and say, well, you remember what Jesus said, you know, she's just asleep. And so, you know, it's again, it's not announcing to everybody he's raising people from the dead. He just woke somebody up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Then that that happened with the, some of those the the man that was uh, healed of leprosy, you know, and and others that, that had healings from Christ. First thing they want to do is go tell everybody because of the excitement of what had happened to them. But you know, he he understands Jesus does what what it would mean. So all right, our time's gone. We've just got about eighteen minutes before the worship hour begins. Uh, let's close out with a word of prayer, please. Father, thank You so much again that we have this privilege to be together with Your children, that we might be able to worship Thee, and to glorify and honor Thee in this worship, and to be able to strengthen, and encourage, and help one another. Be with us, Father, those who have worshipped the early hour to keep them safe as they go home. And for the others of us who are here, Father, for the second worship hour, bless us that we will glorify and honor Thee and be strengthened in our inner man. In Jesus' name, Amen.